So in section 210, we started taking a look at the Cartesian coordinate system. Um, in particular, we were looking at graphs um, that were lines, right? Um, we talked about the fact that if we have a line, we really only have to have two points to plot it in order to get a good idea of what the, what the line looks like. Um, and in this section, we're going to expand that just a little bit. So for starters, um, we're going to take a question much like what we had done in the last section. We have an equation, 2x minus y equal 4. And we're going to find the x and the y-intercept, which is what we did before. And we're going to use those to graph the equation. So finding the x-intercept means letting y equal 0. So this is 2x minus 0 equals 4. So this is going to go away. I'm left with just the 2x and the 4. And I can divide by 2, leaving me with x is equal to 2. OK? Just like we talked about in the last section, x-intercepts, y-intercepts are points. If you leave it as x equal 2, it's incomplete. Right? It's an ordered pair. That's how we represent points. So this is the point x equals to 2, y equals to 0. That's the x-intercept. And then your y-intercept is when x is equal to 0. So same equation. So it's 2 times 0 minus the y now equals 4. So this time this one's 0. At that point, I'm left with the negative y, and I'm left with the positive 4. So I'll divide by negative 1. So y is equal to negative 4. Again, that's my y value of my y-intercept. The y-intercept is negative 4. Sorry, 0, excuse me, negative 4. So x is 0, y is negative 4. So this is part of what the question asked us for. And if I have the x-intercept and the y-intercept, then I have two points. And I can use any two points to graph the line. So those are the two points I'm going to use. I already have them. So 2, 0 would be right here. And then 0, negative 4 would be down here. So I have my two points. And I will connect them with a line. Any questions about that? Kind of a little bit of, it wasn't, a, it, all the pieces are reviewed from last time, but they're compiled in a separate way, a new way. Okay, I've got another one here. Um, does it show a picture on your graph, or does it show it blank right here on number two? Is it blank? Okay. So um, let me draw it in. Sometimes getting images to show up the way you want to when you're creating things is not always helpful. So you're going to plot a point at negative 2, 2. So it's going to be right here. And it's going to go like this. And it's going to graph downwards. So this actually is the graph of an absolute value. I believe we'll encounter it later today. Um, the graph would have been given to you to start with. So if you were using one inside of your um, homework, it's already going to be drawn in. Okay, so we're pretending that this is starting out by being drawn in. And the directions want us to find the x-intercept and the y-intercept. So the x-intercept is where we cross this axis. So what are our locations for our x-intercepts? What are the x, what's an x value of one of the x-intercepts? Negative four. Negative four. Yeah, so it is at negative 4, and at that point, negative 4, y is 0, right? That's what makes it an x-intercept. And then what's the other x-intercept? Yeah, it's 0, 0. And on this one, it happens to be the case that the y-intercept is already one of those points. So here's my y-axis. The location where it crosses the y-axis is still at 0, 0. We will list it separately like that so that we're sort of confirming that we've checked that that's my y-intercept. Sometimes they coincide and sometimes they don't. If they do coincide, they're coinciding at 0, 0. So we can start out with an equation. This was a linear equation and find x and y-intercepts. You can also start out with a graph like we did here and find x and y-intercepts. But sometimes when we start out with one or the others of these things, they're not linear, okay? 
the process is still the same. x-intercept, y is 0. y-intercept, x is 0. So we're going to go through all the same things as we did on problem number 1. It's just that solving it's going to be a little bit different because it's not linear. So I have y squared plus x minus 16. So I tend to find my x-intercepts first. I think it's an alphabetical thing. So x-intercept is when y equals 0. So in this equation, that gives me 0 squared plus x minus 16 equals 0. So this piece is 0 because it's 0 squared. So this leaves me with x plus 16. I'll move my 16 to the other side. So solved for x, it's 16. So what's my x-intercept? Yep, 16, 0. x is 16, y is 0. And then we'll do our y-intercept. So the y-intercept is when x is equal to 0. So on this one I have y squared plus 0 minus 16 equals 0. So there's zeros in the middle now. I need to get y alone. So just like on the last one, the first thing I'll do is I'll move my 16. But this time it's not just y is equal to 16, it's y squared is equal to 16. So we'll take a square root, exactly. But we just put a square root into a problem. So what does that mean? Y'all remember? There's a hint, I just shifted it. Plus or minus, right? When you take the square root of a number, you can get the positive value of that square root or the negative value of that square root. So let's solve it so I can go back and I can show you what happens. The square root of a square is y on the left. What is the square root of 16? 4. Four. So go back up to what my problem was here before I took my square root, namely y squared equals 16. If y is 4, is 4 squared equal to 16? Yes, right? No problem. If y is negative 4, is negative 4 squared equal to 16? Yes. So anytime we introduce a square root into the problem, we also, along with it, introduce the positive and the negative. Because there are two values that I can square and get a positive 16, namely positive 4 and negative 4. <coughs> so what that's telling me then is that I have two y-intercepts. One of them is at 0, 4, and the other is at 0, negative 4. So do not be misled at this point and think, hey, look, I got two values, 4 and negative 4, therefore, my ordered pair is 4, negative 4. It's not. Those are both y values. The x value in both cases was 0. So you want to roll it Meaning what? Every single time you have a point as the question, which is the intercepts it's asking for, yes, you're going to write it as an ordered pair. Oh, I see what you're asking. If you did 0 and plus or minus 4, would that be okay? Yeah. I'd be okay with that. You could do that. Yeah, that would be all right. I'll just put this as an or as a reminder then. All right, the next one. So you had a different kind of an equation. Questions, directions are the same, right? Find the x and the y intercepts. But this equation is got a fraction involved. It's a rational equation, in fact, because it's got a ratio. Our process is still the same. Our x-intercept is when y is equal to 0. So if y is equal to 0, I have 0 on the left, 1 minus x squared on top, and 5 plus x squared on bottom. So this 0 is the same thing as 0 over 1, right? You can always write something over the value 1. doesn't change it. It's no problem. The reason I mention that is because at this point, if I think about it like this, I can think about cross-multiplying because I have a fraction on both sides, right? So as I cross-multiply to each side, this top one, 0 times 5 plus x squared, is what? Yeah. It's 0. It's 
a very common mistake to somehow end up just bringing this five plus x squared up. It's not. It's been multiplied by zero, so this completely zeroes out that denominator. The other one is multiplied by one. So it doesn't zero it out, but it does stay the same. So it was one minus x squared. Okay, at this point the problem is actually a lot like we got to over here. I have a y squared and I have a 16, now I have an x squared, it's not a 16 but I have a constant, right? It's quite similar. So I'm going to separate them on two sides of the equation. I will add x squared, if you want to subtract a 1 you can do that instead, it doesn't matter. So x squared is equal to 1, because these add to 0. So what am I going to do at this point? Square root. square root. Okay, that's what I did on the last one, right? Square root. And if I put a square root into the problem, what do I have to also do? I need to do a plus or a minus. So I'm going to shift this over because I can, with my tools, get space in there. So what is the square root of 1? It's 1, right? So I'm out of space, but this is x equals, and it's positive or negative, 1. So if you want to do like Caden suggested and do positive or negative 1 and then 0, you can do that. If you want to write them separately, you can do that. This is 1, 0 and negative 1, 0. I have two x-intercepts this time. Now we'll do y-intercepts. The y-intercept is when x is equal to 0. So I have y equals... 1 minus 0 squared over 5 plus 0 squared. What will that simplify to? Yeah, 1 over 5 or 1 fifth. So what is my y-intercept? It's an ordered pair. What is it? Yeah, x is 0. Remember, that's where we started out. Every time, one of them is 0. x is 0, y is 1 fifth. So my y-intercept is 0 and 1 fifth. Okay? I chose these two problems specifically, although it's chaos looking at the board with the mic right now. Hopefully, as you were writing it down, it wasn't so chaos. Because I wanted you to see that sometimes you can have one x-intercept and two y-intercepts. And sometimes you can have two x-intercepts and one y-intercept. So there's not like a, there's always more than this than that. It doesn't work like that. It just depends on the equation that you're using, all right, as to how many you get of each one. All right, the last part of this section we're going to take a look at, or maybe I should say the next part, um, is talking about graphing lines, non-lines, excuse me. So we worked on graphing lines in section 210. In section 211, we're going to graph non-lines. So anything that's not a line would fit into this category. Um, in particular, when a line or when a graph is not a line, we need more points to graph it. I mean, that's just reality. We want to try to choose well with at least five points. So with a line, we needed two points. That was great. With non-lines, we need at least five points. While it's not always true. Often, the numbers negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2, these are for x, are good choices. Now, what do I mean by not always? Well, if there's a fraction involved that makes things really hairy and ugly, we might not want to choose those values, right? Just like we didn't with lines. So we might adjust our choices a little bit along the way if there's anything like that happening. But most of the time, these five values work pretty well for us. So we're going to do some examples. I already mentioned that we were going to do one of these. This one's an absolute value example. And I am going to start with those good choice values that I just mentioned because there's, there's good reason to pick them. They're very small. They're simple to work with. All those things are very nice. So negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And we're going to be substituting them into the equation for x. So, working from the inside out, I am going to put negative 2 into an absolute value. So what's the absolute value of negative 2? 
2. And then I'm multiplying it by the 3 in front, which gives me 6. The next one, putting in a negative 1. The absolute value of negative 1 is 1 times the 3 in front is 3. Now we're going to put 0 in. The absolute value of 0 is 0. And 3 times 0 is 0. Now we're going to choose 1. The absolute value of 1 is 1. And 3 times 1 is 3. The last one is 2. The absolute value of 2 is 2. And 2 times the 3 in front is another 3. Uh, yeah, 6. Sorry. I remember where I was. There are five points listed here. They're not listed as ordered pairs. They're listed in a grid, right, where the x value on the left corresponds to the y value on the right. And we're going to plot those five points. So negative 2, positive 6 would be right here. Negative 1, 3 would be here. 0, 0 is at the origin. And then I have 1, 3 and 2, 6. What is this going to look like? A V. In fact, every time you have an absolute value graph, it will look like a V. It may be wider or it may be narrower. It may be shifted left or right, or it might even be flipped upside down, like an upside down V, depending on the other things surrounding it. But if there's an absolute value in the problem, you're going to get a V. So we're going to connect our lines, I mean, connect our points with lines. And it looks something like that. Any questions on that? So we're going to do another one that's quite similar next. It's actually the graph of y equals negative x squared. Um, once again, the values that we picked with the negative 2 up to 2 are, are pretty good values here. Um, in general, we're not going to just adjust them at random. There's no need. We'll adjust them if there's a need only. So negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. So on this one, I want you to remember that exponents happen before the negative because the negative at the front is being multiplied by what comes next. Order of operations always has exponents happening first. Okay, so as we're taking a look at this, the first thing I'm going to do is square things. So what is negative 2 squared? 4. Positive, right? Yeah, it's positive 4. But then the negative at the front is going to make it now a negative 4. How about negative 1 squared? 1. Right? That's 1. And then what's the negative in front going to do to my 1? It's going to make it negative 1. 0 is typically very friendly. 0 squared is 0, and a negative times a 0 is still 0. And I've got 1. 1 squared is 1 times the negative at the beginning makes it a negative 1. And then my 2. 2 squared is 4. And then I've got the negative at the beginning making it a negative 4. So I've got 5 points and we're going to plot them. So we have negative 2, negative 4. Negative 1, negative 1. 0, 0. 1, negative 1. And 2, negative 4. And it almost looks like a V. If you look at it too quickly, it does look like a V. But I'd like to draw your attention to why this actually created a V and why this one doesn't. Are you ready? Let's look back at why this one created a V. If I'm comparing the slope of what's happening here, uh, let me use a different color. How about purple. 
If I go to the right one, I go up three. And I go to the right one and I go up three and there's stair steps that are all the same height, right? Same thing if I go the other direction. I go to the left one and I go up three and I go to the left one and I go up three. From the points that I plotted, they're all a slope of three or negative three. That doesn't happen over here. Here I go to the right one and I go down one and then I go to the right one and I go down three. Those are not stair steps of the same size, right? That's happening because we squared things, right? We squared them instead of actually taking absolute values. So the signs were adjusted and so forth to give us this nice symmetric view. But I do not have a shape of a V. What shape do I have? It looks more like a U. So there is a curved feature to this. In particular, it's called a parabola. So we have a shape that looks like a U instead of looking like a V. So be clear when you're drawing. Are you drawing Vs? If so, make sure your edges are straight. Are you drawing Us? If so, then make sure they don't look straight. Please don't make me or make the grader guess as to what you're trying to draw. Guessing doesn't usually work very well. You usually just get points taken off. Okay. So without doing anything right now, like to actually start the problem, what do you think this one should be shaped like? A U because there's an x squared. So every time there's an absolute value, I'm gonna get a v-shape. And every time there's an x squared, I'm gonna get a u-shape. That's important to notice. So we can use those same list of ordered pairs that we had before. That, that is the x values for it, I mean. So x can be negative two, negative one, zero, one and two. So on this one, if I do the negative x squared, it's going to give me the same values I had before. And then the plus 5 on the end is going to add 5 to all of them, right? So as I work through this, I have negative 2 squared. I do, the square root, um, I'm sorry, I do the square first. Negative 2 squared is 4 times the negative 1 in front makes it a negative 4. And then negative 4 plus my 5 makes it a, a 1. So let me write it out because some of you are looking like I think you just did too many steps in your head. So every single value we can do this with, and you can use scratch paper to do it. You can use a calculator to write it out. That's okay with me. I need to see your table of values, but the work to show for getting the table of values is up to you. So I'll do this with the next one. We'll do negative one. So this is what it looks like if I'm trying to evaluate it. And I'm working from the inside out. So inside of that parentheses is negative 1. The negative 1 is being squared. Negative 1 squared is 1. And then moving out from that, the negative at the front takes over. So that 1 becomes a negative 1. Plus the 5 at the end makes it a 4. Zeros are always friendly because zeros just knock the x squared out completely leaving me with a 5. And I expect some symmetry, right? This is a U graph. So as I go to the number 1, and I think about the number 1 from an equation perspective here, I no longer have this negative in front. So I have 1 squared, which is 1, the negative at the beginning making it negative 1 plus the 5 afterwards, making it a 4, just like it did before. So I see the number 4 showing up again, right there. So without doing any computations, what would you expect the next y value to be? A 1, right? There's symmetry involved. My y values went up, and now they're coming back down, right? So I went from net 1 to 4 to 5 to 4 to 1. And if you aren't sure if it's going to happen on a particular problem, you can test it every single point, and it will work fine to do that, too. So these are the ordered pairs we're going to plot. Negative 2, 1. Negative 1, 4. 0, 5. 1, 4. And 2, 1. And if I connect them in that U shape that I was already expecting, looks just like the last graph, but what? How is it different than the last graph? Because we're doing it on the x-axis. 
Say it again, Caden. Going over the x-axis. We are going over the x-axis. That's true. Can you notice anything else? Okay, so what you're actually thinking of is the y-intercept value is different, sorry, right? Sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. You were just describing but it I, from the perspective of a line. So, yeah. So if you think about what's happening at the end here, there's, there's like a plus zero on the end, so the y-intercept is at zero. Here there's a plus five on the end, so the y-intercept is at five. That five on the end is taking the entire graph and it's just shifting it at five. Can you tell that? You see it? That's what's happening. That's what the 5 on the end is doing. It's shifting all of our graph up 5. Okay, let's do a different one, different type of an equation now. We have y equals 3 fourths x cubed. So this one feels very unfriendly to choose the negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. However, if we choose things that cancel with that denominator, it becomes unfriendly as well because I still have to cube things. Do you see that? So even though negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2 are going to give me in, one pla in two places, rather, fractions, they're still the best option for what's going on in this particular graph. So let's say you weren't sure and you were like, you know what, I really want that 4 on the denominator to cancel, so I'm not going to pick the ones that we had picked before. So if you try that and it works, then that's great, and you can pick that point. There's nothing wrong with that. However, on this one, if I try that, like for instance, let's say I try picking four. Whoops. If I try picking four, which is what I'm sort of inclined to do, like I like the idea of picking four here. Um, four cubed, do you know what four cubed is? What's four squared? 16. 16 times four is actually 64. The number gets really big. So you have a 3 on top, a 4 on bottom, and you have 64. And while the 64 and the 4 do reduce, I still end up with 3 times 16, which is an exceptionally large number to try to plot on my graph. Right? When they ask you to graph something within the worksheets and things that you're working on, they always draw a grid. And the grid is not going to go to 48. And that's what this number is. Do you see the problem? So... We can't just change it to 4 because it will be off the grid. So we're going to go back and we're going to use the negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And we're just going to grin and bear it when we get fractions in a couple of spots. Okay. So let's actually use 2. 2 is actually a very nice value here. So what is 2 cubed? I know you know that one. Eight. eight. Thank you, Emily. It is eight. Do you see how the eight and the four reduce? Yes. What do they reduce to? Two. So this, I'm sorry, I left off my negative in the midst of that. I'm sorry. Let me put the negative in there. It would be negative eight. My bad. This eight divides by four evenly to give me a negative two. And then the 3 times the negative 2 is negative 6. Okay? Yeah? And while I'm at it, we might as well talk about what would happen if it was just a 2. What would I get? I get positive 6, right? Because 2 cubed is positive 8. So I get a positive 6. So down here at the bottom, I have a 2, 6 value. Um, the one values are the ones that are less than friendly because I do end up with values that are um, fractions. So if we put in negative 1, what is negative 1 cubed? Negative 1. And what is 3 fourths times negative 1? It is negative 3 fourths. And we're just going to be uncomfortably okay with that. It's not going to graph exceptionally well, but at least it's on the grid. 48 wasn't on the grid, right? And I could do the same thing with the number 1, right? So if I take out that negative, what is 1 cubed? 1. And 3 fourths times 1 is 3 fourths, right? There's that symmetry showing up again. Not exactly the same as before, but still symmetry. And what happens if x is 0? 
It's zero. I told you you're gonna like zero. Zero is pretty often a nice value. So we're gonna plot these five points and just going to do our best to approximate those three-fourths values. So I have negative two, negative six down here. I have negative one and negative three-fourths, approximately there. Zero, zero, one, three-fourths, and then two, six. Um, this has to be smooth because it's a polynomial. There's no jagged edges when I have polynomials. You've probably seen this graph before. It is a, a cubic graph because it's x cubed. And the shape always looks kind of like this. I can draw it very well. Not too bad. That's pretty good. So it always kind of looks like it's got a curve in the middle of it right there. But you could see that if you spun it 180 degrees, it would be like a spinner on a, on a board game, right? It looks just like this edge and this edge are mirrors of one another. They spin. That happens all the time with a cubic graph. So that's always typical. So thinking about that kind of a feature, there are actually, and because I've been mentioning it along the way, several types of symmetry that are involved with graphs. And we've encountered all of these but one. The first one, x-axis symmetry, is a reflection of itself over the x-axis. We haven't encountered this one, okay? Um, we actually did, we just didn't graph it. Um, the graph that we had where we had y squared involved over here, not the graph, but the equation. Um, which one was it? That one right there, number three. Number three would have had some type of an x-axis symmetry. We just didn't graph it. So we've, we've seen it, we've just not graphed it. So an x-axis is a reflection over the x-axis itself. So I'm going to draw a picture of an example of one so that you have a reference point. What these will look like on your homework when they're doing this um, is that they're going to give you a graph. Right? If you've flipped through your homework, you've seen this already. They're just going to give you a graph, and they're going to say, identify which symmetries are involved. Okay? So this is an example of a graph that has x-axis symmetry. So it looks like it's a parabola, but it's sort of laying down on its side. And what it means is it means that if I folded it, what it means to have this kind of symmetry is that if I folded it along the x-axis, right, they would match up. That x-axis is acting like a mirror. So when the x-axis acts like a mirror, it has x-axis symmetry. And y-axis symmetry is the same thing, it's just acting like it along the y-axis. So if I took that same graph, I'm out of space really to do it well there, but I actually used a you know sort of regular parabola, not the flipped over on the side one. You can see that mirror happening in the middle as well, right? It's a mirror image, right? So what we would say about our bodies in general is that our bodies have y-axis symmetry, right? It's not perfect. None of us are perfectly symmetrical, but we're pretty close, right? The left-hand side of your face, the right-hand side of your face, and all the way down, you have y-axis symmetry. Um, another way that you can think about these symmetries is that that y-axis or that x-axis cuts the graph into two identical pieces. So the x-axis is cutting the graph into two identical pieces, one above the x-axis and one below. On the y-axis one, it's cutting into two identical pieces, one on the left, one on the right. And then the last one, which we have talked about just a moment ago, is called origin symmetry. So origin symmetry is a symmetry that looks like it's been spun around the origin. And we had that one happen right here on number, number eight. So if you were to spin it 180 degrees, like the spinner on a board game, the image on the left top is the same as the image on the bottom right, like that, okay? So this image, I'll redraw it over here. Not well, but I will redraw it. Has the piece over here mirroring the piece over here. So that if you were to spin it 180 degrees, it would land right back down on top of itself. It's called origin symmetry. Now here's the interesting thing about all of these symmetries. You can have none of them, or you can have one of them, or you can have all of them. 
okay? So we're gonna go back to the problems five through eight above and identify which of them are present on those particular problems. And then I'm going to draw you an example of one that has all of them, because none of the examples we've done so far have all of them. But what you can't have is you can't have two. Write that down, please. Somebody's gonna tell me that you've got two of them. It's gonna happen on a test, it's gonna happen on a quiz, I don't know where it's gonna happen. Maybe multiple places by multiple people. You cannot have two of these symmetries. If you have two of them, you have all three. Okay, so you cannot both mirror over the x-axis and mirror over the y-axis and not also have origin. You cannot have origin and mirror over x and not have y. So let me show you, we'll do the ones we already did. Let me go back. Um, looking at five, what kind of symmetry, ignore my um, purple marks, what kind of symmetry do you see happening on number five? Yeah, this is y-axis symmetry. So on problem number five, we have... Oh, I've just got it right there. I'll just write it on my screen. You guys got a separate paper spot to write it. But this is y-axis symmetry. What about number six? What kind of symmetries do we have? It's y-axis again. Y-axis is a popular one to have, by the way. Y-axis symmetry. How about seven? Y-axis symmetry, are you bored yet with the y-axis symmetry? It happens all the time, no joke. Super, super common. And then of course we already know the last one because I already referenced it. What does this one have? Origin symmetry. So let me draw you a couple of examples so you can see ones that have all three, okay? And I'll draw you an example of one that doesn't have anything as well, just so you can have a reference on those. So let's say we have, I'll draw three graphs and you guys can tell me what we've got. Okay, which one of them has no symmetry? The last one. There's symmetry, but it's not one of the three we talked about, right? If I asked you to draw a line of symmetry that cut this evenly in half, you'd draw it somewhere about right there, yeah? You would, but that's not the x-axis and it's not the y-axis. So if we were examining that graph, we would say that it has no symmetry. There's no way that, that red's showing up very well. There's no symmetry of the three types that we're discussing. This has no symmetry. Both of the other two have all three types of symmetry. Can you see it reflected over the x axis, sorry, over the x axis like this from top to bottom on both of them? Can you see it reflected over the y axis from left to right? Yes. Can you spin it 180 degrees and see that it lands back down on itself? Yes. You know this shape. The shape's a circle, of course, at the beginning. So this is all the symmetries in this one. So it's the shape of a circle. Ovals would work, too, for that shape. Does anybody know what this shape is, just out of curiosity? You might have seen it in an Algebra 2 course. That's usually the first place people see it. It's called a hyperbola. So they do show up. Um, they don't show up often in earlier mathematics courses, but it does have all three symmetries, right? There's no way to draw something that has x-axis symmetry and y-axis symmetry without it also having origin symmetry. You get zero, one, or all three. 